today we are beginning what two messages we'll see it's entitled when my heart is overwhelmed ask somebody do you know about that some people didn't ask they say yeah I know I know <laughs> when my heart is overwhelmed here David in Psalm 61 calls upon the Lord cries out to God and in so doing, David begins to reveal to us that when your heart is overwhelmed, the first posture to take is to call out to God. Now, calling out to God, that seems like a normal response to a crisis. But understand, it's more than just going through the motions or an action. It is an actual actuality establishing a different mindset. And so here... Let's look at verse 1 and verse 2, which is our focus this morning. He says this, Hear my cry, O God, give heed to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Here the psalmist begins to call out upon God. And in this moment, as he's standing there in this moment, we see him talking to God. And yet at the same time, this is the beauty of it, the Bible says all scripture is inspired by God. It is, the New International Version says, it's God breathed. And when God breathes on something, it produces life. God breathed in that man's nostrils and he became a living being. Every time we look in this word and are open to it, we receive life from it. So all scripture is inspired by God. What is happening? David is talking to God, and God is talking through David to us. And the merger of David's need is the presence of divine revelation. And so here, David is crying out, to God. And David says, as he describes his heart, he says, when my heart is faint. My heart is faint. What does it mean to be faint? To be weak? To have the absence of strength? To feel feeble? Even to feel like you're losing consciousness? He says, when my heart is faint. King James Version says, when my heart is overwhelmed. Overwhelmed is the idea that you find yourself overtaken by something, that the pressure of it is weighing down upon you, that you are defeated by it, as if you've been immersed in water and you are going down for the last time. When my heart is overwhelmed, there's another word I want to throw in the mix. It's the word whelmed. Sometimes we're overwhelmed and sometimes we're just whelmed. Whelmed is when you find yourself pressed on both sides, but not crushed. That means you have to exert all the energy you have in order to be equal to the challenge. Here, David is at a point where he says, I'm overwhelmed, as if the pressures of life have come upon me like a wave. And I find myself under the flood of what's happening. We got to stop and ask the question. What was happening in David's life in this season and moment that caused him to say, my heart is overwhelmed? My heart is overwhelmed. Here, David has an experience and it's tied into relationships. Oh, let me add to that, family. You ever, had <laughs> you ever had a family issue cause you to have your heart overwhelmed? You ever had relational issues that send you into a tailspin and you feel overwhelmed? Let me tell you, David is in a moment, we see this in 2 Samuel, he's in a moment that he feels overwhelmed and the context has to do with his son Absalom. Absalom, his son, Absalom 
has a brother, a half-brother by the name of Abnon. I'm going to kind of set the stage about Absalom, and then we're going to go into the particular period that in which David is talking about. So Absalom has a half-brother named Abnon. Abnon is in love with Absalom's sister. You staying with me? He loves her, it says. He loves her, and she's beautiful. She's beautiful, and he loves her. And it says in that context that he loved her. He wanted to be with her so much that he made himself ill. Ill that he could not do something to her. Can you catch that? He wanted to do something to her. He wanted to get close to her. He wanted, he didn't want to see her from afar. He wanted to have an encounter, a sexual experience with her. It's like a man who's just there. He's, he's thirsting for water and can't get it. And there he is. He's made himself sick. And here he is. Every day he's looking at this woman, seeing this woman. He wants to get closer. He can't get it close. He can't get in proximity to be able to do something to her. So he devises a plan. He gets help to devise this plan. How many know when you want to do something wrong, you can find people to give you counsel? <laughs> That's what the psalmist says, watch out, don't sit in the seat of scoffers. He tells us about the relationships we have. So you can find somebody to endorse the wrong thing you want to do. They give him counsel. He, he gets counsel, and what he does is he pretends to be sick. Now, in his mind, he needs sexual healing. <laughs> Some of you guys have been around for a while. <laughs> He's pretending to be sick so that... So that Tamar can come in and bring him a meal to help him feel better. She comes into the bedroom where he is, brings him a meal, and he forces himself on her. And he violates her. Now, you know what's interesting in that text is this. It says he loved her. But after he had done what he wanted to do with her, it said he hated her. And it said he hated her more than he ever loved her. Remember, you can't take truth out of love. And so, now when Absalom is told what Abnon did, he is furious. He wants to put a hit on his brother. And so, he goes and, and he talks to David. And David, David is interesting here because David seems to have a, a big heart regarding his kids, even to a point where I would say he's out of balance. And you'll see that in a moment. And, and yet he has this huge heart toward his kids. And, and in this, he doesn't do anything to bring any kind of corrective measure to Abnon. And so Absalom is feeling this, and he's angry, and he's upset, and nothing's being done. And for two years, this thing lingered in his spirit. And he began to devise a plan. And he began to go and gather people and and he talked to the king, deceiving the king about what his true motives were, and went out and he killed his brother. Word gets back to David, Absalom has killed all your sons. Okay, that wasn't true. Somebody got overexcited. Came back and said, Absalom's killed. No, and the next report says, no, he just killed Amnon. Now, I don't know if that makes you feel better. But Abnon is dead, and here's David. David is feeling the weight, the grief over Absalom, of, of Abnon being dead, and we discover that also Absalom now has fled, getting away from the king. So he's got one king that is, one son that's dead, and the other son who is running for his life. And so one is dead, and the other one has disappeared, and here David is grieving one, and David is mourning because of the distance of his other son. And as time goes on, Joab, David's right-hand man, recognizes that David longs to have Absalom back, even despite what's happened. It says that David comes to resolve. He realized Abnon is, Abnon is dead, but I still want to have Absalom around. And so he goes out and he gets, he gets Absalom, brings him back to the kingdom. But the king and, and Absalom don't see each other face to face. They're separate, but they're in close proximity. And this goes on for a while. And after a while, Absalom kind of approaches 
He wants to approach, he wants to talk to uh, Joab to see, hey, Joab, can I see my dad? And so he's calling out to Joab, and Joab's not returning the calls. And he calls him again, and Joab doesn't return the calls. And see, Absalom is a treacherous person. And Absalom realizes, okay, he's not returning my calls. I'm going to get his attention. We live in close proximity. He goes out and burns up his field. He gets Joab's attention. Joab <laughs> comes to Absalom, and they begin to talk. He says, I want to go see my dad. I want to be able to, to be around him and, and get close to him. And so Joab works out that, that Absalom is able to go and be with his father, David. And when they see each other, they greet each other. They're, they're loving towards each other. They kiss each other. It's like they're full reconciliation. But see, because Absalom is treacherous, he doesn't reveal his real heart. And under his heart is an underlying motive. And so what happens as they leave the meeting and things go on and everybody's excited, Absalom goes down to the gate of the city. And at the gate of the city, this is where business is held. And this is where things are dealt with and issues are brought to the table for the king to bring judgment on. And Absalom goes down the gate, and people come with their issues and come with their circumstances and come with their things to be resolved. And Absalom stops them and says, what are you here for? He says, uh, I'm coming to have this issue resolved with the king to work out. He says, hmm, I look around. I don't see any king's representatives here. Huh, I would think if the king really was concerned about you, he would have somebody here to take care of you. But if I was the man, then you would be covered. You'd be taken care of. You would experience favor. Matter of fact, I, as I hear your case, I would favor you. And to the next person, I would favor you. And to the next person, I would favor you. And as, as it was going on, he was beginning to build up the people with a sense that he would protect them and cover them more than ever than anything you've seen in King David. So he was building up himself while he was putting down David. And as this is going on, it says it affected the hearts of the people, and their hearts turned. And it says he stole the hearts of the people from David, stole their hearts. And the people, see, they're thinking they're getting a better man, a more caring man, a more sensitive man, and Absalom is all about himself. And so now... Absalom comes to a place of influence, more people are with him, more people are following him, and at this point, Absalom is at a place where he can take the kingdom. And they say to David, understand, Absalom is at a crazy state. He's can, he can take this thing and run with it. As a matter of fact, if he, he'll kill us to get it. So we better move. We better get out of here. So here is David and his men leaving the, the, leaving the kingdom and running for their lives. And Absalom is coming to take over the throne. And while David is out there, out there running from his son, people now feel emboldened to go up to him and curse him to his face. Here, David is so overwhelmed by this moment and what's happening. Here he is, he's overwhelmed by this, that when he's cursed to his face, one of his men says, who is this dead, dead dog who think he can get up in your face? He said, come on, let's chop his head off. I want to tell you, the Old Testament was gangster. It really, <laughs> ain't no messing around. Who is this dead dog? He's going to be dead. We're going to cut his head off. David said, wait a minute. David said, no, don't do that. Let's tell you where David is. David said, don't do that. Maybe the Lord is speaking through him to me. David is overwhelmed. David's overwhelmed. They come to a point where Absalom is taking over, he's moving, he's, he's got things. And, but see, the Bible says Absalom, he wasn't just a, a handsome man. He was a beautiful man from head to toe. And one of the things that was striking about him was his hair. He had this incredible, beautiful, gorgeous hair that he cut once a year. And it grew long and it weighed a lot. And one day he was riding along on his mule. I would think if you're the man, you'd have a horse, but that's all right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> sometimes you just can't see things when you're self-deceived. So, so he is, <laughs> he's riding along on his mule, and most likely on a mule, he's bouncing, and that hair is flying, 
And as that hair is bouncing, his hair goes up, and he gets stuck in the branches of the tree. And the mule keeps going. And there he is, stuck in the tree by his hair. And one of the men who was a part of David's group came back and told Joab, Absalom is stuck in the tree by his hair. And Joab said, did you kill him? He said, no, it's the king's son. Uh -uh." And Joab says, where is he? He told him where he was. Joab got some men, they went over, and they pierced him through the heart, and they killed him, gangster style. They are excited. The men of David that stood with him through all this, they are excited because now the enemy of David has been killed. They're going back, David, David, your enemy is killed. David said, well, is Absalom all right? No, 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 you you don't get it. Your enemy has been killed, but how about Absalom? Absalom has been killed And David says, oh, Absalom, and he begins to weep and mourn over Absalom. Absalom, where's my son? And he weeps and mourns in such a way that it deflates his army. They're like, I thought we did something. Obviously, in the eyes of the king, we've done nothing. And Joab has to bring the king and pull him aside and say, understand, you're deflating your men. And this is what they believe. They believe you love the one who tries to kill you, and you hate the ones that try to save you. David is overwhelmed. And so here we find David in this season and moment crying out in Psalm 61, when my heart is overwhelmed. David cries out to God, and there are three things we see in these first two verses. The first thing David does, let me stop for a moment, because i got to stop and, and establish something. And that is, that many of us can find ourselves at a place where we are facing the idea of being overwhelmed. But what is so significant is two people can experience the same challenge, the same upheaval, the same craziness, and one is whelmed by it, and the other is overwhelmed. What is the difference? The difference is how they respond. And there are three fundamental ways in which you can respond. One is spiritual. A spiritual response is what God thinks about it. See, when, you, when I have a spiritual response, I'm thinking, what does God think about it? What does God want me to do? How does God want me to handle that? That's a spiritual response. Then the second would be a rational response. That's what I think about it. What do I want to do? How do I want to handle it? And then there is the third one, an emotional response. The emotional response is how I feel about what I think or what I feel about how God thinks about it. And so you find yourself at a place, and there are times that the spiritual and the rational and the emotional can all work together, but sometimes they don't. And that's when you have to make a choice. Which one is going to be first? Will it be the spiritual? Will it be the rational? Will it be the emotional? You know what's interesting it says about David? In Acts chapter 13, verse 22, it says, David is a man after God's own heart who pursued the will of God, who wanted the will of God. You know what's interesting about that is David, then it could be said, for the most part, David sought spiritually how to deal with issues and respond to issues. But David had preset emotional triggers. What do you mean preset emotional triggers? That for David, his trigger was relationships, especially his family. So when he had a family issue, the gun went off emotionally instead of spiritually. And so you know what's interesting? Some of us can find times where we're walking consistently with God. We are strong in the Lord. We're faithful in God. And so when a situation comes up, we can, and when it comes to money, we are not, we're not overwhelmed. We're just whelmed. When it comes to sickness, we're not overwhelmed, we're just whelmed. But many times when it comes to family or relationships, we're not whelmed, we're overwhelmed. And so 
It's in this, we see, and David has these preset triggers, and he has to make a choice. And at this point, he chooses the emotional response. And as a result of that, David is now overwhelmed. And in this, David begins to cry out. And there are three things that we see in these first two verses. The first thing David does when he cries out is he says to God, hear me, hear me. Say that, hear me. Hear me. me." What is that? What is that about? That's about feelings of spiritual, spiritual inadequacy. It feels like something has changed and where I felt the ability to be bold in the presence of God, now I feel like something is there And I don't feel that confidence anymore. I don't feel the confidence I once possessed before God. I I feel like there's something wrong in me, therefore I can't be close to God. And so if I have to go up to a person and say, hear me, please hear me, then I'm I'm coming to the conclusion that they really are not interested in me and I got to get their attention. And I feel inadequate that I am not of value that God wants to spend time with me. He says, hear me, hear me. Second in this context is this idea that God is saying, or that David is saying, find me, find me. He says, from the end of the earth, I call to you. Anybody ever been to the end of the earth? Anybody? The end of the earth? Maybe if the basketball player Kyrie is right, the earth is flat, as he said, then maybe you can find the end of the earth. But for most of us, the end of the earth is not a literal place. It is an emotional place when we feel like nobody else understands. Nobody else is connected. Nobody cares for us. Not even God. I'm out here by myself. From the end of the earth, I call to you. So he's saying, find me. He's dealing with feelings of spiritual distance. Where is God? You ever been at that place? Where is God? And sometimes we get frustrated with God. Oh. That means we get frustrated with God and we won't admit it. But it manifests in our lifestyle in our choices, in our actions. And sometimes we need to go to God and say, I'm frustrated with you. I, I don't understand. you got to help me. You need to get it out so you can get some healing in. But if you hold on to it, then you call it something else, and, but it kills your responsiveness to God. The third thing he says is, lead me. Lead me. Lead me. Our feelings of spiritual despondency. Now he's come to a place that he feels like, okay, at this point, there's there's a loss of passion for God. There's a loss of passion for the things of God. God, God, I feel like I've been so far out here and and lost in this. I want you to know this is where your emotions can take you to a place where you feel such a disconnect that I'm so far out here at this place. God, I've lost my passion for you. I used to be the one that got to church early and left late. Now I'm the one that gets to church late and leaves early. I've lost my heart for the things of God. I used to be counted on. They could count. They could, I was the clock in the church because I was so consistent. Now they don't know when I'll show up. Something has turned, and there's a despondency regarding the things of God. My heart has been overwhelmed, and I've been lost in this emotional place of chaos and disorder. And and I'm confused about God because I think God doesn't see me, doesn't hear me, is not concerned about me. But can I tell you something? That in the midst of being overwhelmed, David shows us something. In the midst of your emotional upheaval and chaos, David shows us something. What do you do? Call on the Lord. Call out to God because things change when you call out to God. 
regardless of how you feel, regardless of how you have come and begin to rationally try to figure the situation out, regardless of where your emotions have flung you to and fro, what you need to do is call out to God. Because when you call out to God, something's going to happen. When you call out to God, heaven comes down on earth. When you call out to God, things cannot stay the same. Hallelujah. Maybe your heart has been overwhelmed. Maybe because of your wrong response. Maybe because you've taken a rational response or an emotional response. But if you, in the midst of where you are, feeling like a place of inadequacy, like I don't have what I used to have in his presence, feeling distance from God, do you know that there's possible to have feelings as if, God, I need you to lead me because if you don't come get me, I can't get back. You, you know what I'm talking about? That you are so caught up in your confusion and chaos, the things that are happening in your world, in your life, that you don't know how. God I can't even see the way back. Come and get me. That's what happens. When you begin to call out to God, things change. Let me turn to a verse. They, they're not going to have this for you on the screen, but just, just follow me here. Psalm 18, it says this, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Did you know that David was a worshiper of God? He knew how to celebrate the Lord even in the worst circumstances. Look what he says. I called upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. See if this sounds like your experience. The cords of death incompressed me. The terrors of ungodliness terrified me. The cords of Sheol surrounded me. The snare of death confronted me. In my distress, <laughs> I called upon the Lord. I cried out to my God for help. He heard my voice from his temple, and my cry for help before him came into his ears. And I just want to give you one phrase out of verse 7. Then the earth shook and quaked. <laughs> he says, when I cried out, there had to be a, res there was a response that changed and shook things. Hallelujah. I want to tell you there are some things that happen when you cry out to God. When you call out to God, things happen. Remember, we talk about it's not just an automatic response, a religious gesture, but a changing of the way you think. Here he says, look, he calls out to God. And the first thing I want to say, and this is not necessarily in chronological order, but the first thing that happens when you call out to God is that you are embracing your identity as a child of God. When I call out to God, I acknowledge something. He's my father. I'm his child. That regardless of what we've gone through and the chaos and the disorder, he's still my father. And I'm still his child. And when I call out to him, I am reigniting, I'm establishing, I'm reconnecting with the fact that I am a child of the most high God. Hallelujah. And God takes care of his children. Tell somebody, God takes care of his children. They say, I'm trying to help you to see this. Come on, you got to get through it. You got to get through. You got to get through. God takes care of his children. The second thing, when you call out to God, you are accepting the fact that he never lost you. See, when you go through something and you feel like you're at the end of the earth, 
you feel like maybe I've lost God somewhere. But where is God? If you're at the end of the earth, where is God? At the end of the earth. He never loses you. That when you call out to God, you have to say, hey. I'd say is, hey, he's right here. He's right here. He's present. God never lost you, never lost sight of you, never lost connection with you, never lost a sense of purpose for your life, never lost sense of your destiny. God is right there. He never lost you. Tell somebody, God never lost you. Did you know the Bible says when we are faithless, he remains to be faithful? Talk about the love of God. Hallelujah. That when we turn this way, he turns this way right behind us. So as soon as we turn around, there he is. When we call out to God, you are reigniting faith. Faith for the present and faith for the future. See, when you call out to God, you're saying, God, I'm believing you again. I'm believing you again. Despite what has happened, despite my confusion, despite my feelings and my emotions, I'm believing you. I cry out, I call out to God. Matter of fact, in the Old Testament, the term cry out or call out to God was a term used to describe prayer. He says, God, I'm calling to you right now. I'm calling to you. How many believe that if you call out to God, things will change? How many believe that if you call out to God, things will change in you? Oh, no, 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 no. I said, how many believe if you call out to God, things will change in you? Before things change outside of me, things have to change. God wants to change things outside of me, but he first wants to see things change inside of me. Change about what I believe about him. Change about the priority of his place. Change about his purpose. I have to now change. And when I call out to God, something's changing on the inside that sets the stage for something to change on the outside. How many know when you go through something and you respond emotionally, one of the things that begins to suffer is your prayer life? You stop talking to God. What happens? That there is something that needs to be adjusted inside of you. And you you want something happening on the outside, but something hasn't happened on the inside. I believe the Lord wants us to call upon him today. I said, I believe the Lord wants us to call upon him today. Now, 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 maybe I've got a room full of people where nobody's overwhelmed and nobody's even whelmed. But maybe there's some people like me in the room that at times feels so pressed. I'm so pressed. I'm not crushed, but I'm pressed. And it takes everything to be equal to the challenge. Sometimes when you're pressed like that, you are fighting the fight of faith to choose the spiritual over the rational. Sometimes when you're pressed like that, you're fighting the fight of faith to choose the spiritual over the emotional. And you are fighting with all that you have. See, when you started the fight, you were fighting like this. But now you are fighting for your fight like a girl. You are trying... (laughs) I'm getting tired now. I'm getting tired. (laughs) When my heart is overwhelmed, I need to call upon the Lord. I need to call out to God. Tell somebody it's time to call out on God. 